Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Champa Patel, and I'm the director of the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House. And we're delighted to have so many of you join us today for our conference on security at the frontier, which will be taking place uh, for a few hours this morning and also again tomorrow. Now, the focus of our conference, as many of you will have seen, is about how global connectivity has brought with it a new range of security threats, such as new cyber vulnerabilities, uh, including to critical infrastructure and the internet of things. But cyber technology has also brought with it new, a new security focus on outer space, which has become key to the functioning of national and international infrastructure on the ground. Um, in addition, technologies using the electromagnetic spectrum are generating exposure to new challenges and threats, including the prospect of electronic warfare. Now, these challenges have expanded geographically as countries explore new physical frontiers, such as the Arctic. Um, so our conference will examine these latest developments in cyberspace, outer space, electronic warfare, and the Arctic, and consider how can the UK and Japan best respond to these challenges. So very much looking forward to the discussions on some of the key security issues of the day. Now, some housekeeping before we start. On your screens, you will see interactive tabs that will take you directly to the agenda, session outlines, bios of all of our speakers. So all the information should be accessible to you. If you'd like to raise any questions during any of the sessions, please feel free to do so. We want to make this as interactive as possible and as much of a conversation as possible. And in order to do so, please use the ch chat function that you will see on your screen. We will try to make sure that we respond to as many of those queries as possible through the event. Now you'll also see on your screen that there's a networking space. And this is a space where you can connect with others, not just our speakers, um, but also participants who are here joining the conference. Uh, you can connect with them through the session by email. So with great pleasure, I will now hand you over to session one, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Champa. So hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the cyber session of the Security at the Frontier. This event takes place on the record and is being recorded. My name is Masahiro Kurosaki, an Associate Professor of Public International Law at the National Defense Academy of Japan. It is my great pleasure to chair the session. And this session will discuss the bilateral relationship um, and consultations on cyberspace that the UK and Japan have been holding since uh, 2012, 2012. And what has been the main success of these consultations and what are the remaining opportunities? How can the two governments work together in international forums, including at the UN, to ensure a free, open, peaceful, fair and secure cyberspace amidst diverging approaches to internet governance by the major powers? How can the UK and Japan work together to promote responsible state behavior in cyberspace, including through discussions about the application of existing international law to cyberspace? How do the two countries align on global data governance under the Osaka track launched by former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe at the 2019 G20 summit uh, with increased national initiatives threatening the free flow of data across borders? What are the cybersecurity implications of COVID-19 and how have the UK and Japan responded? And to address, to address these questions, uh, um, we have imp an impressive lineup of speakers for, for the panel. So allow me to introduce three panelists. And the first speaker is Jamie Saunders. He's fellow at the Oxford Martin School at Oxford University and a visiting professor at University College London. He's also a senior executive advisor at Nihon Cyber Defense. He served for 29 years in UK governments, including DCHQ and the Cabinet Office. Most recently, he was director of the National Cyber Crime Unit, part of the UK's National Crime Agency, and previously director of international cyber policy at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And the second panelist is Tomohiro Mikanagi. He is deputy legal advisor of the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, overseeing the interpretation and application of international law, including international law relating to cyberspace, and managing the submission of treaties to the Diet. He studied international law 
in Cambridge from 1992 to 1994. And after serving in Tokyo, New York, and Beijing, he came back to the UK in 2017 and served as the head of political section at the Japanese embassy for two years. In 2018 and 2019, he co-organized workshops relating to international law and cybersecurity at the Law Topact Center for International Law as a visiting fellow. His publications include Establishing a Military Presence in a Disputed Territory, Interpretation of Article 2, 2 3, and 4 of the UN Charter, and Attribution of Cyber Operations, an International Law Perspective on the Park Jin Hyuk Case. And the third speaker is Emily Taylor. She's an associate fellow with the International Security Program at Chatham House. She's CEO of Oxford Information Labs, author of several research papers, and is a frequent panelist and moderator in conferences and events around the world. Previous roles in, have included chair of ICANFUI's review team, Internet Governance Forum multi-stakeholder advisory group, Global Commission on Internet in Internet Governance Research Network and Director of Legal and Policy for Nominates. She has written for The Guardian, Wired, Ars Technica, The New Statement and Slate, and has appeared on the BBC Now, Now Show and the BBC Radio 4 Longview. Emily is a graduate of Cambridge University, qualified as a solicitor in England and Wales, and has an MBA from the Open University. And with respect to the format of the session, first I will hand over to Jamie, Tomo, and Emily for their opening remarks in that order, followed by a cross discussion among them. And then I will move on to the Q&A session with the audience. So if you would like to ask a question, please type and submit it uh, throughout the event via their chat function on the conference platform. But in doing so, please do not forget to specify the name of the panelist who would like to ask you a question so that I can pose it to, to our panel properly. Now, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Jamie first. Jamie, all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just uh, before I start, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I hope that that will help uh, you follow uh, my remarks. I'll start by saying that um, I've worked uh, closely with Japan for just over eight years now. Uh, and my first time working with Japanese was setting up the UK-Japan cybersecurity dialogue uh, that you've just uh, heard about. Um, I've been a regular visitor to Tokyo until uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, and as has already been said, um, I'm a senior advisor to a cybersecurity company uh, based uh, in Tokyo. So although um, I'm a visiting fellow and a visiting professor, I'm really speaking as a practitioner, both in terms of as a businessman now and previously um, as an intelligence officer and as a, a diplomat. What I want to talk about is why uh, bilateral co cooperation on cyber is important uh, for the UK and Japan. Uh, and I shall cover the three topics that you can see on the screen there, our mutual security dependencies, our shared interest in an open global digital economy, and the opportunities uh, that exist within the global cybersecurity marketplace. And I'll conclude with some suggestions on what that implies for how we take the UK-Japan cyber, cyber dialogue uh, forward uh, in the coming months and years. But I'll start with our mutual security dependencies. The first and perhaps the, the key point is that we are close allies. Uh, we uh, work together in various military theatres um, and our defence supply chains are becoming uh, increasingly uh, enmeshed. Um, there was a, you'll, you'll be aware of the agreement that Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister May signed in 2017. That signifies a, a deepening of the defence relationship and security relationship. Uh, and there has been a steady increase in the amount of uh, defence industry supply chain activity between our two countries uh, since. 
Um, Japan plays a very important role in the UK critical national infrastructure, in energy, in transportation, and in other uh, fields. So clearly, we have an enormous interest in the cybersecurity of, of big Japanese uh, industrial companies. Um, and London is a very important hub. Uh, for J Japanese business operating throughout the European, Middle Eastern and African market. And that applies to a whole range of sectors, but I think it's particularly important in the financial sector, uh, given London's importance um, as a financial hub. Uh, and then finally, we have some common interests in ensuring the trusted supply chain, particularly in the telecommunication sector. Um, I co-authored a report that was presented at the Keough University International uh, Cybersecurity Symposium uh, in December uh, 2019, looking specifically at the question of 5G, the role of Huawei equipment and so on, which has obviously been a, a massive issue on the political uh, debate uh, over the last uh, few months. So in short, we have a huge amount of mutual security dependencies uh, and cybersecurity cooperation uh, is therefore an essential component of that. As has already been mentioned, uh, we also have an interest in sustaining an open global digital economy. Um, the uh, Osaka track from the G20 has already been uh, mentioned. Um, I'll also mention the importance of promoting best practice cyber regulation. And we've been working together in the G7 on that. The Bank of England works very closely with the Financial Services uh, Agency of Japan on financial uh, cybersecurity regulation. And we both share a view uh, in terms of the importance of ensuring interoperability between different regulatory regimes across the world, because that's essential if we're going to have a low friction trade in both products and services. Uh, we've also been looking together, this is another issue from the KEO uh, Symposium at uh, IoT security standards and building on the good work that has been done uh, within the EU on that uh, issue. And then finally, and uh, Tomo is going to be touching on this in more detail, um, we have a shared interest in promoting cyber stability. There's the work in the UN Group of Governmental Experts, which I'm sure Tomo will re refer to. We've also looked at uh, joint work in the ASEAN uh, Regional Forum. And again, uh, one of my roles in 2012 and my first and very happy visit to Tokyo uh, in 2012 was to discuss uh, the UNGGE and our positioning in the UNGGE with uh, my uh, uh, opposite number in the Japanese. Japanese foreign ministry. Um, and then finally, um, I did want to touch on the commercial opportunities for Japan and the UK uh, in the cybersecurity market. Uh, this is uh, already $145 billion annually, and it's expected to grow to a trillion uh, dollars annually by 2035. And I'm lifting those figures from a World Economic Forum uh, report that was issued uh, last month. I believe that the strengths that the UK and Japan has in this market are highly uh, complementary. Uh, and I mentioned there three particular areas where I think the UK has, uh, has uh, strengths. Uh, a lot of this building on several decades of uh, global leadership in intelligence, signals, intelligence, so on, that has made the UK very, very strong uh, in all three of these uh, areas. Um, I think that there are tremendous opportunities, uh, both for the UK uh, in the Japanese domestic cybersecurity uh, market, but also perhaps more importantly for this conference, there's huge opportunities for us to work together uh, to use our complementary strengths to win joint business in the global uh, cybersecurity market, which as I say, uh, is already large and is going to get even larger in the coming years. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the supply chain assurance issue. I think the importance here in the context of 5G is that we need to ensure that there are viable alternatives to Chinese manufactured equipment in circumstances where we don't believe we can trust uh, the Chinese equipment in parts of our uh, critical national infrastructure. And one of the recommendations in the Keo uh, report that I mentioned earlier 
um, was that we should seek to see how we can uh, incentivize our own companies to uh, re-enter uh, the 5G uh, market so that we've got uh, viable uh, alternative supplies. And then my final uh, slide, uh, just to summarize um, in terms of what I think this means for the UK-Japan uh, cyber dialogue, I think we do need to continue to strengthen uh, the agency to agency collaboration, uh, both government to government, government to business and uh, business to business. The intent is there, uh, but I think there's more that we can do to, to thicken uh, the relationship between our two countries. Um, I think there's more we need to do in terms of promoting international best practice regulation and public policy. Um, as I said before, interoperability is uh, vitally important and mutual recognition of regulatory standards uh, is an important role for that. But we also need to future proof our regulation and work together to think how is the technology emerging and what are the implications for our standards and uh, regulatory uh, regimes. And the WEF report I mentioned was focused focusing uh, on that uh, issue. And then finally, as I've said, I think we can strengthen the commercial cooperation, both to facilitate access to each other's domestic markets and to win business together in the rest of the world. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, for offering comprehensive and straightforward remarks. And now I'd like to hand over to Tomohiro Mikanagi. Tomo, over to you. I am Tomohiro Mikanagi, Deputy Legal Advisor of Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I will be talking about the uh, legal aspect, uh, application of uh, existing international law to uh, cyber operations. I'm working for the government, but uh, today's uh, presentation will be uh, made in my personal capacity. Um, first, uh, Jamie has uh, explained uh, the bilateral uh, cooperation uh, in a very good way, but uh, I'd like to point out that there is a very high level recognition of uh, each other, UK and Japan, as a natural partner in promoting uh, rule-based international order in cyberspace. I quoted the joint vision statement between prime ministers uh, issued in August 2017 here. And when I say uh, rule-based international order, I think there are two aspects. One is the uh, application of existing international law, which I'm going to talk about, and also uh, rule making in areas such as uh, uh, e-commerce. There's a, a negotiation uh, starting in WTO, and uh, Japan and the UK had just signed the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. And also uh, there's a, a treaty called Budapest uh, Convention on Cybercrime. And there's also a suggestion for new uh, treaty. So these are the uh, uh, rule making uh, effort. But today I focus on the um, application of existing international law. There's a very close communication, as uh, Jamie has uh, pointed out. We have a regular dialogue uh, between the uh, foreign ministries or uh, NISC or NCSC and so on. Um, we are uh, covering uh, wide ranging issues. And the international law is uh, one of the uh, areas we have been uh, talking about. And one thing is very clear, uh, Japan and the UK have uh, both uh, strongly supported the applicability of existing international law. Maybe um, 10 years ago, there was uh, a strong opposition to or doubt about the application of international law to uh, cyberspace saying that cyberspace is a new space and the existing international law doesn't apply. But that phase is now over. Um, UN uh, GG discussion has uh, reached agreement on the applicability of existing international law. So question uh, now is how uh, existing international law applies uh, to uh, cyberspace. And discussion on the application of international law have uh, tended to uh, focus on use of force armed attack or armed conflict, somehow. Uh, we have been focusing on um, that aspect. But uh, more recently, I think uh, actual cyber operations have not amounted to a uh, use of force level or armed attack level. And uh, something uh, more or less, uh, uh, I think, uh, powerful, but causing uh, serious damage, like uh, cyber attack on the medical 
uh, facilities for vaccine research have uh, attracted more attention. And in uh, addressing these issues, I think uh, uh, some uh, concepts like uh, sovereignty, uh, attribution, or due diligence, these are kind of a traditional uh, classical concepts of international law, but uh, they are now, I think, becoming more and more important in addressing these new phenomena. With that, I'd like to uh, uh, briefly touch upon each of these uh, three uh, concepts, because these are uh, very simple uh, concepts, but difficult to apply. In this spring, I quoted uh, Oxford's statement uh, on international law protection against cyber operations, which was issued in May 2020. Um, more than 100 international lawyers participated in this statement and uh, Oxford scholars uh, uh, facilitated, coordinated uh, their discussion. And paragraph two I quoted here uh, says, international law prohibits cyber operations by state that have adverse consequences for essential medical services. But this uh, paragraph is uh, kind of intentionally ambiguous about the legal basis of this uh, uh, statement. Um, that has a reason uh, because there is a kind of ongoing debate over the relationship between sovereignty and non-intervention. And I know that the Chatham House uh, published a very interesting report uh, last year on this ongoing debate. And here, uh, there is a slight uh, difference of approach between UK and Japan. UK is a bit uh, cautious about uh, admitting the existence of a violation of sovereignty uh, beyond non-intervention. Non-intervention requires coercive element as uh, Nicaragua ICJ judgment uh, clarified. And uh, whether uh, there is a, a full overlap between the sovereignty and non-intervention is debatable, but the uh, UK is more cautious about uh, uh, extending the scope of uh, violation of sovereignty beyond uh, non-intervention rule. That, this might sound very technical, but uh, in reality, coercion is difficult to prove. So whether there is a uh, full overlap between these two concepts probably matters in a real uh, context. And I, um, UN members have not uh, agreed on this uh, particular issue, but they have agreed that existing international applies to the cyberspace. And from my uh, point of view, I think there have been a uh, state practice supporting the uh, concept of sovereignty beyond non-intervention and in uh, the effort to uh, prove that point, I quoted Budapest Convention on Cyber Crimes. This is a, a Council of Europe uh, Convention on the Cooperation Against Crimes in the cyberspace. And I think this, uh, who, uh, the, those who uh, drafted this uh, paragraph uh, were intended to say the, it is not allowed uh, for a state to uh, uh, obtain uh, data from other state without lawful consent. Um, what is the reason for this uh, restriction? Um, I think uh, respect for sovereignty must be the uh, reason for this restriction. But I have to admit there is still ongoing debate. And the, the one possible reason for this ongoing debate is the states engaging uh, clandestine cyber operations prefer to uh, preserve their freedom. Um, the, that is understandable. But for those who are not doing that, it's difficult to uh, recognize uh, the, these activities as valid state practice. So I think these states' concern should be a duty taken into account, but there's also danger um, of uh, creating an um, unregulated area in international law by uh, creating exception to existing international law. So very uh, careful uh, balancing act is uh, required here. Second, I touch upon attribution issue. Um, there are so uh, many uh, so-called attribution statements, and uh, but they are not really uh, legal attribution statements. They are more or less political uh, accusation. 
and they do not invoke any state responsibility or they do not refer to any violation of international law. And that's fine. The states are probably uh, allowed to do that in a diplomatic or security uh, domain. But in the uh, legal domain, it is more complicated. And uh, ILC, International Law Commission, adopted uh, uh, articles on state responsibility. And this article is not uh, accepted as a treaty or legal instrument yet, but these provisions are useful in uh, finding out uh, what the law might be. And Article 8 uh, is probably the most relevant uh, provision because um, cyber attacks, cyber operations uh, tend to be uh, conducted through proxies. So governments are not directly involved, but somehow uh, exercising influence over these proxies. And this article uh, talking about the instruction, direction, or control. But these terms are not uh, clearly defined, unfortunately. But the thrust of this uh, provision is you need to prove some specific influence of state over the non-state actor if you are to uh, attribute that cyber operations to a state. And that is a very difficult part. Um, evidence on cyber attribution uh, from another state, uh, you need to uh, uh, find the information about uh, the use of IT infrastructure in uh, other countries. Um, they use multiple layers of aliases and proxies. So it is naturally very difficult to collect evidence. Um, UK has been more active in making statements attributing cyber operations to states than Japan. And, uh, but as I said, it's, they are not a legal attribution. Um, I think legal attribution would uh, require a higher uh, standard of proof. And uh, lowering this higher standard of proof would uh, make it easier for the victim state to uh, attribute uh, cyber operations. But that uh, also have a danger of uh, inviting uh, uh, accusation and countermeasures not based on the credible evidence. So here again, we need to strike an appropriate balance between uh, the uh, you know, facility uh, easiness for the uh, victim state to uh, uh, attribute and not to invite too many uh, accusation countermeasures uh, not based on the uh, credible evidence. Um, last point is about uh, due diligence. Um, due diligence is a um, kind of jargon. And uh, uh, I quoted the uh, Kof Channel uh, judgment, very old, uh, 1949 ICJ judgment. It uh, confirmed this uh, every state's obligation, uh, blah, 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 in a kind of general term. But application of this concept has become a uh, little bit uh, uh, controversial. Uh, but I think uh, this concept is important uh, exactly uh, because attribution to a uh, state is difficult. Um, because it is uh, you know, conducted through uh, proxies, it is always difficult to find a clear, strong evidence. But this due diligence concept does not require attribution. But state can invoke a responsibility of a state over non-state actors under their jurisdiction or influence. So this uh, might prove very useful in addressing the problem of uh, use of proxies, I think. But unfortunately, UN members have not yet agreed on whether this due diligence obligation applies to cyber operations. And I think there is a valid uh, concern about ambiguity of this uh, uh, obligation. Uh, there's no clear definition of uh, what constitutes due diligence. But I, I think uh, the core, at the core, there is a obligation of a state to use its uh, influence over a non-state actor. And uh, this obligation is useful because this uh, obligation could uh, oblige states to refrain from uh, supporting proxies. This aspect of uh, due diligence obligation has uh, not been discussed in a detail or clear manner, but I think, uh, this usefulness in uh, uh, addressing proxies issue should be taken into account. So uh, 
the kind of conclusions. I think I uh, believe free flow of data must be protected. You know, uh, e-commerce is really important. And uh, application of international law should not cause over regulation. But uh, rule-based international order is in also important to uh, 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 for the uh, peace and the stability. And cyberspace uh, should not be excluded from the application of ex existing international law. So we have to uh, strike a good balance between these two directions. But, uh, I think the focus or priority should be uh, cyber operations damaging a critical infrastructure, but difficult to attribute to states due to the use of proxies. And uh, I think these uh, uh, cyber operations could be prohibited under violation of sovereignty and due diligence would be useful in addressing the um, proxy uh, problem. So far, the uh, approaches taken by UK and Japan are slightly uh, different, but as uh, Jamie uh, rightly pointed out, we share the interest, security interest and other interest, and we agree uh, on the importance of striking a right appropriate balance uh, between the freedom of regulation. So I think what is important is to involve uh, people from different uh, expertise, not only uh, legal and technical, but also uh, security and economy uh, trade experts should join in the discussion uh, to find a good balance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tomo, for excellent overview, focusing on the collaboration between the UK and Japan in the field of international law and norms in cyberspace. Uh, well, indeed, as highlighted, to what extent cyberspace is legally subject to the principle of sovereignty is quite controversial among states. And as such, I would say that it remains to be seen about how this issue comes into play in the future UK-Japan collaborations in the cyber context. And now, let me hand over to the third speaker, Emily. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, I, like the other speakers, I'm going to just share some slides to um, to, uh, to complement my comments. Let's see, I hope you can see those uh, slides now. Uh, so, when we're thinking about, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, three things. I'm going to talk about um, 5G and what we learned through all of the fairly tumultuous um, uh, events of the last two years surrounding decisions of states on purchasing 5G infrastructure. I'm then going to talk a little bit about what we, we think is happening in international standards bodies and the impact that that could have on um, the internet, the single internet itself, and of course, consequently, the, the flow of data um, and e-commerce between countries. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, international processes such as the GGE and open-ended working group um, as other speakers have done. And then finally think, you know, propose uh, some thoughts about how to uh, strengthen bilateral cooperation between the UK and China. So first of all, on 5G, it's quite, it was quite a surprise for people like me. My background is you know, primarily as a lawyer, but I've worked in the internet industry for 20 years. And in the early days, we always used to talk about the need to keep politics out of technology. And, uh, and luckily, I think for those involved at the deeper layers of the internet in the infrastructure, naming and addressing, we more or less got away with it for quite a while, but I think 5G was the moment where we start to see it rising up the political agenda and not only um, heads of state um, and governments um, having very strident views on 5G telecommunications infrastructure, but also that's, that's spilling out into the, the general political um, uh, scene. Um, so why was it that 5G proved such a lightning rod? Um, and, and, you know, in, in many cases, the, the, 
directed at a single company, Huawei. For, to my mind, the, the, the real um, problem, and other speakers have referred to this, is lack of competition in the market. We have a very highly concentrated market. You know, there are only really three firms internationally, Nokia, Ericsson, and Huawei, which have the capability and capacity to build out an entire country's tel telco network. Others have exited the market. Um, and so if you take one of those competitors out of the market, there are also security risks involved. Um, you might have the failure of one of those operators and you might have all of the competition concerns that we see in other markets, the ability to, uh, for firms to act independently of market forces, put up prices and so on. We saw an, a playing out um, and an articulation of national security concerns with regard to a single country and uh, questioning the closeness of uh, um, an ostensibly independent uh, company Huawei from the Chinese government, different views on that. But clearly, once you're putting equipment into the ground, you're going to have to be living with that at least for a five to 10 year horizon, probably longer because nobody likes to dig up infrastructure. And, and so it is absolutely appropriate to consider national security alongside all of the other issues that come into play when you're building out um, in, uh, infrastructure like 5G a lot of, uh, alongside the need to maintain momentum, innovation, competition, and uh, and not delay the build out um, in the national context. One of the reasons why different countries had different approaches to, to 5G was the, the different use of Huawei in legacy systems. So the, the US and Australia were fairly free in, in, in being able to say, well, we're going to have an outright ban, but the UK and other countries already had extensive use of Huawei in legacy systems. And I think Japan and UK have similarities in this, you know, in some sense, not at the forefront of the most strident rhetoric, wanting to maintain those close alliances with the US and with each other, um, uh, and, um, you know, but not wanting to alienate uh, China with, with whom there's substantial inward investment and, and a lot of shared uh, business uh, uh, relationships. And so the, the initially, the approach was to prefer a low key evidence based approach, and work primarily through industry. It seemed like the 5G um, roller coaster had just sort of pulled in to the to, to the station. Um, when we started to to get the technical community raising concerns about what's happening in standard bodies. And this, this I think, plays into the remarks made by uh, Tomohiro and Jamie about the impact on free flow of data. What happens, we all take for granted that the internet's basic infrastructure will remain the same. It's really served us well, even during the pandemic, um, it's estimated that um, traffic has gone up by 30%, and yet the internet's been there for us. It hasn't fallen over. It hasn't sort of uh, suffered any failure. And as more people are using technologies such as this, which are bandwidth hungry, very rich media, the internet has supported it. Um, and yet uh, China has been proposing a suite of protocols throughout um, uh, five or six study groups within the um, ITU, the UN's International Telecommunication Union, which if adopted, and that's a big if, but if they were adopted, they all fit together to create a different vision, a different architecture and replace the TCP IP protocols, the domain name system, the IP addressing, which is actually uh, the glue that holds the internet together and makes it work. And um, as Director General Roberto Azevedo said in Japan at the Osaka track uh, announcement, a fragmentation, however it occurs, would hurt us all. Um, 
you know, trying to piece together what might be happening and what, what the implications might be with China and standards. I think the choice of forum matters, and I'm going to come back to this in the next slide. Um, standards that are developed through the ITU, as well as us, us, a couple of other standards bodies, enjoy protections through the World Trade Organization rules. And so equipment bearing those standards cannot be barred in international trade. If you like, it would avoid a repeat of what Huawei has been experiencing over the last couple of years. And when we see the, the impact of the Belt and Road and also China's generosity to um, developing countries in building out uh, telecommunications and internet infrastructure, um, one of the questions, you know, so if you like, if you put all of these technologies together, they could, at a domestic level, really enhance the implementation of uh, measures like social credit uh, when you put the technologies together. And potentially, if you standardize them and pop them into equipment, you could export social credit in a box. And I'm sure there, there are plenty of countries who would be quite attracted to that sort of internet. The technical community in the West are you know, fairly derisive about the benefits or perceived benefits of these technologies, but I'm not quite sure that we are yet asking the right questions. Uh, the technical, the engineering community like, well, on an engineering level, this is, this is pretty rubbish and not needed, so I'm moving on now. But I think we should all, all as you know, policy, with policymakers, human rights organizations, ask ourselves, what happens if we get this anyway? If, if it's adopted by some countries, not others. Others have spoken very eloquently about um, international law and uh, the responsible state behavior in cyberspace. So I'm, I'm really going to touch on this very lightly. Um, but just as we're seeing forum shopping in standards, I think that some states have been very entrepreneurial in the way that they are using different fora for, uh, to push forward different agendas. It used to be that internet governance naming and addressing was dealt with in, in uh, multi-stakeholder bodies like ICANN, but just as ICANN has quite successfully limited its scope and not done scope creep, that has left a gap for the, you know, where we deal with a lot of the issues that are currently animating people like cybersecurity, international um, uh, cooperation and responsible state behavior. And that gap is being filled in the UN environment. Um, we're doing a, a special issue on um, norms and cyber governance for all, which is going to be finalized at the end of next year, but we'll be publishing articles in the Journal of Cyber Policy throughout next year. Um, and I think that, you know, as, it, as is recognized in the Japan-UK Joint Declaration on Security Cooperation, cyberspace is a key area for cooperation, and there is a lot of common ground. I mean, Tomohiro mentioned differences, subtle differences in um, our interpretation of international humanitarian law, and that's important. It also uh, shouldn't... Um, shouldn't obliterate or, um, or blur uh, all of the areas in which we have mutual interest, because I think that there, there would be a common view that voluntary existing norms and applicability of international humanitarian law is probably the best way to go rather than uh, uh, a cybercrime treaty uh, through the UN at this stage. And one of the hopeful um, and um, optimistic uh, views is how well the dialogue on confidence building measures and particularly cyber capacity building has been going within the OEWG, the open-ended working group. I think a lot of us were a bit worried that that forum was going to uh, turn quite rancorous and polarized. And this seems to be a hopeful sign that we can move forward on areas where there can be cooperation and mutual interest. So, to wrap up, all of the benefits of a bilateral approach, particularly um, in context where the sort of multi, there's uh, dropping confidence in 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 multilateral uh, um, cooperation at times over the last few years. Um, on five G, 
uh, quite an interesting um, recommendation by the UK Defence Select Committee this year. Uh, they're suggesting the creation of sovereign 5G infrastructure capabilities across um, the, the, the 20 largest democracies. Quite an interesting idea. Um, um, on a practical level, there's a lot of excitement about Open RAN, which is the uh, uh, almost interoperability of telecommunications infrastructure so that you don't end up with vendor lock-in. You can have, you know, swappable parts. And um, this could be a way in which to stimulate competition. And it's pleasing to see that both um, the UK and Japanese telcos are enthusiastically participating in that. Um, um, risks of fragmentation. There are always risks of fragmentation. Um, and I think that that's um, every network almost has that characteristic that it's almost always trying to pull apart as much as stick together. But I think in that context, it's really important for like-minded states um, to, as particularly those with advanced technical capabilities to work together and find uh, mutual interests and try and take the temperature down in, um, in the geopolitical tensions, promoting shared values and advocating for all the things that made us excited in the early days of the internet, which we somewhat forgotten to keep articulating, the benefits of a single interoperable internet uh, based on um, openness and democratic values. So um, hopefully as democratic allies, Japan and UK can continue to work together fruitfully to promote responsible state behavior uh, based on shared values and voluntary actions to promote peace and stability in cyberspace. Thank you. So thank you very much, Emily, for your great remarks. So now I would like to proceed to the Q&A session on second thought, we, as we have a limited amount of time allocated. So, uh, and we already have uh, uh, so many questions and actually the, the chat box is flooded with so many questions, which I really appreciate. And uh, so first, let me start by asking these questions from, for I think all of you, the three panelists, uh, from Michael Nelson uh, from Carnegie Endowment, Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he, he's, he asks, this may seem like, a, I read out, uh, this may seem like a basic question, but it is a critical one. How do you define and use the word cyberspace? And as everything gets connected to the internet and the cloud, what will not be part of what you call cyberspace? And, and for instance, UNESCO uses cyberspace to refer to a common space for people to share ideas. Uh, the US Cyberspace Solarium Commission's definition focuses on the hardware, such as servers, devices, uh, fiber optic cables, and William Gibson, who coined the term cyberspace, called it a shared hallucination. So how would you respond to the, uh, these questions for all of you? So who's up first? I'm happy to go first, if that's helpful. Yes, please, Jamie. Um, and, and I'm not being flippant uh, when I say I actually think that the William Gibson uh, shared hallucination is the best uh, definition. And, and the reason I say that is I think there are lots of technical definitions of what we mean by cyberspace. But I think from a, a public policy point of view, it's a shorthand for saying that technology is, share, is, is transforming a wide range of political, economic and social systems and processes and understanding um, how those transformations are taking place and the implications of those transformations for public policy is what we're doing when we put cyber hyphen in front of um, a lot of the, uh, the issues that we're discussing. I can. Yes, Emily, please. Um, 
Yes, it's, thank you very much, Mike, for those questions. And and coming from a kind of internet community background, we tend to avoid the use of the term cyber. Um, and then moving more into a policy space, I see that I, I became used to it because that was how all of the, uh, the colleagues described what we would call the internet. But of course, the internet is changing so much from... The, the what it was even 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago and I think that in a way that yes the shared hallucination it it gives us a not it's a bit like trying to define an elephant you know one when you see one but it's actually quite difficult to nail down all of the qualities that make an elephant an elephant but with cyberspace I think that there are key concepts like the 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 networks and connectivity the connectedness of of technology and data flows um and so it can it is wide enough to encompass uh, issues like the internet of things um the 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 mobile broadband and what we're just on the brink of artificial intelligence and perhaps quantum computing so uh, i've got used to it um, it, it wasn't a term that I spent much of my earlier career using, but it seems to to be a, a, a useful enough catch-all. And certainly in the journal, we interpret it very widely indeed to cover any kind of technology uh, policy issues. Thank you. So before turning to Tomo, let me announce that we have prepared a... Um, uh, a poll question for you and I'd like to invite you to take part in the poll. I think it stays visible to the audience. I mean, it's displayed on the screen during the session. And uh, if I understand it, the results will be reported back to us via uh, the Zoom chat function at the end of the Q&A. So now uh, uh, I'll turn it to you. Tomo, please. Hi. Yes, um, that is very good and fundamental uh, question, I think. Uh, when uh, we discuss uh, application of international law in the UNGGE or other UN bodies, um, we do not use the term cyberspace. The title of the GGE report doesn't refer to any cyberspace because I think if you say it's a space separate from other space, that would uh, lead to the uh, need for new international law. Now, I think uh, we have agreed on the applicability of existing international law and why? Because all of these activities are taking place on the earth uh, in the world, not in a different space. So uh, we can find some connection, uh, maybe uh, depending on the location of uh, hardware or people or information, I don't know, uh, to the geographical uh, location on the earth. So even though it's uh, you know, usefully called cyberspace, we are not uh, admitting a separate new space has emerged in the world. And all the uh, cyber activities are taking place just in some part of the world. And uh, therefore, international law applies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have a couple of more questions for, I think, for Emily about 5G. Uh, the question from Rowena Lee, uh, who says, I'm from Hong Kong and also wary of 5G in terms of security and privacy concerns. Instead of a ban, can we ride on 5G but constrain it? say, with the satellite internet provision proposed and prepared by, say, Tesla, SpaceX, can we possibly use the satellite as the umbrella or helicopter constraint on 5G from Huawei? Nonetheless, on ground, we also make use of Huawei for now, but try to plug the loopholes and constrain Huawei use. I asked the previous question because 5G indeed is useful. Only that others should constrain Huawei, but make use of it alongside. Thank you very much, Rowena, um, for those for those questions relating to five G. Um, in a way, uh, I think that the original UK policy uh, 
was aiming at trying to get the benefits of 5G while also mitigating the security and privacy risks of uh, a, a very powerful and more intelligent network uh, that, than we have seen before. Um, and so uh, measures that we have seen proposed include um, designation of Huawei um, as a high-risk vendor, making sure that its market share was limited and keeping it out of the core of the 5G network, uh, the core where most of the intelligence is located and where uh, perhaps the potential for harmful actions is most acute. But there are many security and privacy risks arising from new technologies, whether it's 5G, whether it's a satellite, uh, whether it's Internet of Things. And part of the, the risks for 5G are that the, the cybersecurity of the devices that, that are going to be connected to it is, are, are often very poor. We need to... So, we need to enhance the, the usefulness of it, but you're right to be concerned about it. I think um, anything that powerful, anything that that widely used and widely relied on is going to carry with it uh, a substantial vulnerabilities and probably in ways that we haven't um, completely anticipated. So um, uh, I, I think there have been efforts to constrain the use of Huawei. The UK has gone in a different direction um, with an out, a sort of a rip and replace approach now. But the, the past 20 years or so um, in the UK, it has worked with Huawei and set up bodies such as the Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Centre, exactly to do as you, as you suggest, Rowena, which is to understand what the capabilities are, how, the, how it's all working, what the cybersecurity um, processes are within Huawei, and try to sort of reach a, a level of quality assurance. And I think that, you know, it's a fallacy to suggest that one type of net any type of network could be completely secure it's also um foolhardy to to not appreciate the risks of of different vendors or technologies but i think a general risk mitigation evidence-based approach is the right way to go thank you thank you very much we also have one more question uh from kartik ashta from Gateway House. She says, uh, with Japan building the first Trans-Pacific cable to South Africa and the UK phasing, phasing out Huawei in its own telecom sector, do you see UK's Indo-Pacific policy motivated more by tech considerations or do you see the deployment of a career group later in 2021 by the UK to the Indo-Pacific as a sign that security cooperation will be more uh, traditional? So I think this is also for you, Emily, and also you, uh, other Jamie and Tomo. Also, you may add something to that, to, to that if you want. So, but Emily, if, yeah, over to you. I think that you know the the right approach is for tech considerations now they have to be alongside uh, security also economic and trade and and you know so security cooperation is important but it's also important not to lose sight of the other benefits of technology um i you know, I, I don't know whether other speakers have got more specific remarks to, to make in response to this question. Thank you. I, I'm very happy to add to that. I mean, I, I'll focus on the UK Indo-PAC strategy point because I think that the point is, is that the, the UK's um, strategy regarding the Indo-Pacific is based on the realization that geographic proximity um, is of declining relative importance to other things such as fully global threats like climate change, global markets, which are particularly the case uh, in, the, uh, in the digital economy, obviously, for obvious reasons, but also social and familial uh, 
connections between different parts of the world. And that then concludes that the UK has a, a, uh, a sustained political and economic interest in the Indo-Pak region, despite our geographic presence and our, our relative size. If you take that as, as a given, then the question is, well, what levers of power might you require? And the carrier group uh, uh, issue is, is, to me, more a statement of saying that physical kinetic levers of power are still important alongside uh, soft power, uh, technology, et cetera, et cetera. So I see the whole thing in many ways as a hedge. <laughs> it's saying we don't know how specific security challenges will manifest themselves in that region. And we need to ensure that we have available to us all of the levers that we might need to use to protect our interests, be they uh, kinetic or soft, be they virtual or physical. Uh, uh, and we, although we're, it's unlikely we'd be able to operate uh, completely independently in that region, we do need to be able to um, to pay our way. So I think that that is the rationale uh, behind the UK approach. May I add uh, one comment? Yes, would you like to respond? Yeah, um, from the legal point of view, no geographical distance. Uh, doesn't uh, always matter. You know, international law applies to uh, anywhere in the world. What is going on in Indo-Pacific area would affect uh, Europe or other areas of the world through the application of the same rule. So uh, the rule and maybe norms uh, in the cyber uh, operations and cyber area is uh, applicable, should be applicable universally. So UK is right uh, to be interested in what is going on in, in the Pacific, as well as in Europe and uh, uh, North America. Thank you. Well, now that the norms has been mentioned, uh, let me ask you one more question. And this is from Virginia Rigoni via Consulting Australia, uh, says geography and the use of maps topography, rivers, and seas is vital to understanding world affairs. How can maps support the rule of law in cyberspace and uphold international norms and responsible state behavior, which Emily discussed? Uh, how can maps play a similar role in cyberspace in support of these efforts, given increasing interoperability? So this is a question for you, Emily. First, please. Thank you very much. Re really interesting question. And I think that, you know, I'd like to just pull some thoughts from Jamie um, into the response to this, because clearly in, in the online environment and the world that we are living in now, physical difference, distance um, is less important than it used to be. However, geography, topography, still has a very, very major um, impact on the ability to build out the essential infrastructure uh, that, that, that connects people. So in that way, geography it remains very, very important. And the positioning of, so, you know, although we think about this, we conceptualize it in our head as a, like a cloud or something, we, we're almost encouraged to think of um, the online environment as, as something that is just almost ethereal in, value, in, in nature, it is very much rooted in the ground and in, in geography. And your question also made me think about the value of data visualizations, whether we, whether we put that onto the map, the, 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 the map of the world that we're familiar with, or whether we understand the flows of data, whether it's cyber attacks or the intensity of online activity, visualization of data is so important and remains so important for us to very quickly understand what is happening. And I believe that mapping will continue to have a, a very valuable role. There's, there's really interesting work that's come out of Oxford over the last uh, decade or so on mapping the internet. And I just love looking at those, <laughs> those, uh, those visualizations because they tell you so much and often such unexpected messages about what's happening online. Thank you. 
Can I make a, a quick comment on this one? Sure, please, Jamie. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful question, and it reminds me of... Uh, I helped to facilitate a, a crisis exercise uh, in a, a large UK company, uh, uh, one of these sort of simulation exercises. And we were in their crisis room. And in the crisis room were lots of maps of their locations, uh, floor plans of their buildings and everything. Of course, the uh, crisis that we were managing was uh, a data related crisis and so I asked you know I asked the question well where's the map of your data then uh, and what was very clear during the course of that crisis exercise is they didn't really know what they had where it was who had access to it they knew where the gents were but they didn't know where their data was and that that was one of the main learnings from that exercise is that you can't actually manage something that you can't see uh, and therefore, I think that the point that's been made in the question is one that I would reinforce and say, yes, we really, really do need to have some way of visualising what we're dealing with, because if we are, if we can't, then we can't manage it. And we certainly can't manage it in a crisis. Thank you very much. May I say a sure, please. few words? Um, um, it might sound contradictory to what I have just said, but... Uh, when we uh, make uh, international agreements or treaties, we are not free from the geography. Because uh, if you uh, uh, sign a treaty with US, um, that treaty would apply to US and Japan. And if we agree on the free uh, data flow between US and Japan, who are the beneficiary of this treaty? That would uh, uh, have to be decided based on the geographical uh, location. And now we have UK-Japan uh, rules. So different uh, bilateral or multilateral treaties have different contents. And it is becoming very, very complicated which areas of the world are governed by which uh, rules, uh, set of rules. So I think uh, although uh, internet is, uh, has made the world very small, I think we are not free from uh, ge geography or map, I think. Thank you very much. We'll, the next question is from Matthew Feely, who says, trust issues. Uh, he, his question is about technical standards. Uh, he says, trust issues aside, is what Huawei suggesting in a new protocol, a more viable and better solution to what we have in terms of the current internet? How much of not trusting China is due to their, their lead in the build out and as US is not being ready for them? Does this not actually hold us back as if they are developing better solutions now? We may be slowing progress down from a global perspective. He doesn't specify the, uh, uh, the, the name of the public, uh, a panelist, but maybe this is for Emily and also other panelists may, 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 may intervene if you, if you so wish. Uh, thank you for that question. Very interesting and, and valid point. Um, I'm not um, somebody who immediately um, is mistrustful of a technical solution or proposal simply because of its origin. And I think that it's the wrong way to approach uh, technical issues to, to just go, well, it's coming from a, a certain country or a certain company and therefore we don't trust it. Um, the, uh, you know, so, and, and you're quite right that there is a, a definite view that the the resistance to Huawei on 5G was not simply uh, a security issue. It was also tied up in geopolitics, trade issues, and a sort of uh, an identity crisis, if you like, in the United States, which is used to being technologically supreme and having uh, very strong competitors in global markets, not having a domestic uh, provider. With new IP, um, I think my... Uh, and, and my team's um, reaction to it comes from uh, analysis of what would happen if you put, piece together all of the uh, um, all of the elements. And without going into the detail, and I'm I'm really happy to talk to you about the detail or it's set out in our paper, the way in which the domain name system would be replaced with persistent digital objects, 
the um, a blockchain layer would um, would guarantee end to end um, guarantee delivery moving away from the sort of best efforts principle and the merger of data link and network layers means that the role of ISPs and equipment providers goes from just simply moving packets around to a much more of a gateway role, much more deterministic about who's allowed on the network, who isn't, what they're doing. And uh, although blockchain may sound wonderful, um, end-to-end encrypted systems end somewhere. So you always have to look at where they're ending and where they would be ending is with the ISP. And that would mean that there would be pretty much a fire hose of data going to uh, countries. And where you have national um, uh, strategies such as social credit, I think it it is incumbent, it, it it is right for us to ask what is the human rights impact of that? And what would be the impact on a single interoperable route, those lightweight standards and protocols that have served us so well? So it is absolutely not a China bashing exercise here. It is it is really rooted in why are these proposals being made and what would be the impact on the single internet? Thank you. So Jamie Tomo, how about you? Um, I I was simply going to say it's self-evident that by denying uh, Huawei access to part of or the whole of our telecom infrastructure, we are denying ourselves access to uh, functionality at a very good price. I mean, these are, I don't think anyone's suggesting um, that the, uh, it's not a viable commercial proposition, but I think it is a matter of balancing that against both short-term and long-term security interests. And I think the balance of view that we've reached in the UK and many other countries is is the right one. Um, I I, I think that the difficulty of the approach that we had beforehand was that it's fine to say, we'll use Huawei here, but not there. But if if you end up in a position where there's no viable competition, then you don't have a choice anymore. And I think that's an unacceptable uh, position for the UK and many other countries. Um, can I? Yes, sure, please. Um, well, from the, again, um, international law perspective, this uh, Huawei uh, issue is very uh, tricky. If you are going to apply WTO, Rules. And there was a, a dispute settlement procedure uh, between US and China uh, applying the Article 20 or the general exception to the WTO or rules. And the uh, US lost uh, that case at the level of uh, the panel. And uh, so existing rules of GATT or WTO or did not expect this kind of uh, risk to uh, be uh, uh, emerging from the cyber technology. And uh, it is difficult to say, uh, are they legal, lawful or not? But, uh, you know, WTO discussion is now kind of a stuck. And we are not uh, moving uh, very quickly on the uh, Doha round, but we are behind the reality. And uh, we need to, uh, think about what uh, kind of rules should uh, govern uh, these uh, Huawei issue or other supply chain risks. And there's no answer yet, I think. Thank you very much. Now, let me turn to the next question uh, from Tim Riley from the University of Cambridge. He says, to what extent can the US containment strategy uh, be viable uh, against China in a virtual world of content in a virtual world of connectivity and linkage that partly overcomes challenges of a geography. So it's also doesn't specify the name. So who would like to respond to that? I can have a brief swing at it and I'm sure others will. Um, in one of my concerns about the US um, strategy that's been, that's been apparent over the last couple of years is almost it it, um, it 
it sort of hastens the cycles that I think that the US and the West are concerned about. So if you have bans, if you have sanctions and uh, very protectionist strategies, what you're doing is placing China in a position where it has to, uh, for its own protection, it has to develop its own capabilities throughout the supply chain and almost make sure that it can be self-sufficient, whether it's in the manufacture of chips that, that uh, are not familiar uh, in their workings to us, or in in or at the worst, a whole new internet infrastructure. And so, uh, you know, the what we have to try and do is break this negative cycle without um, you know throwing open everything and and be not being mindful of risks we have to try to um, maintain uh, whatever cooperation we can have um, so that we're not actually forcing any one country to cut itself off and become completely independent, because I think that that will bring us exactly what we're most fearful of. Um, and just to sort of highlight some of the questions, uh, other questions, themes in the other questions, we're going to have to get used to a world in which it isn't just Western values, uh, people with Western values who are building out the technologies and running the tech companies. We're going to have to get used to a world in which China is very, very much much a, a, pr a predominant technical player and on all of the issues that that um, highlights for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to take the floor? Um, it's okay. The yes, it's, please. It's, it's just such a, I mean, this is such an enormous, you know, the question of the 21st century, or at least one of them, isn't it? Um, I mean, to, my, my sense is that the approach that existed 20 years ago, I mean, lots of people have said this, you know, that was, was based on an assumption that there would be a convergence of values and political systems and ways in which rules-based international order would apply, that there, there would be that convergence and that we had everything to gain and nothing to fear from uh, a, a, a stronger China, which you know has taken millions out of poverty and is, is, is a very, very good thing. I, I think the problem is that the reality has been one where China has, you know, there hasn't been that convergence. That what has emerged is some pretty competing ideology. And it isn't surprising to me, therefore, that the pendulum is swinging to more of a a containment-based approach. I, I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I guess the, the debate is how far should that pendulum swing? I don't think one's talking about trying to sort of have a complete bifurcation. I don't think one wants complete isolation or fragmentation on technology or anything else. But to be completely open um, as a strategy, I think has, has not succeeded. And therefore, I think we do need to be prepared to use some of the levers uh, that we have at our disposal and, and forms of containment are part of that. I think that's that's a reasonable position to take. Thank you. Tama. Uh, yes. Again, from the uh, rule uh, perspective, you know, TPP is sometimes uh, seen or regarded as a kind of part of containment strategy of Japan. But uh, I think that is not the case. Uh, we have uh, recently signed something called RCEP uh, with China, Korea, and uh, ASEAN, uh, Australian, other countries. Um, there is an e-commerce chapter in RCEP. And the content of the uh, e-commerce chapter in RCEP is not so advanced as UK, Japan e-commerce chapter. But still, there is a reference to uh, data free flow in the e-commerce chapter. So, you know, the speed of uh, kind of advancement in the rule making in e-commerce is probably uh, uh, different in uh, different uh, countries. But we are uh, engaging uh, with uh, China in uh, finding a common rule. And China is also benefiting from uh, the existence of common rule. You know, uh, Huawei is very controversial, but uh, Chinese, Chinese economy depending on the trade. 
and investment from other countries. So from uh, that perspective, we can find some uh, common ground in the area of e-commerce, but maybe we need uh, different groups uh, for a different uh, speed of advancement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I think it would be good to close the session as we are approaching end of time. So, but before that, let me turn to uh, the the poll result that has just come. Uh, it's just come in. So, so would you like to say something about the results for three speakers, if any? Nothing to comment on uh, that. May I? <laughs> may yeah, I? Sure, please. No, Toma, I, uh, rule based uh, international order has won 45%, percent, so probably I'm the winner <laughs> in this panel. <laughs> I'm joking. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you, you win. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we probably have to wrap things up for today. We are close to out of time. And my sincere apologies for not being able to pick up all the questions you raised, but. Uh, I believe all of them will be recorded and become available, at least to the panelists one way or another. But so allow me to make some brief concluding remarks. Uh, of course, I'll be brief. As already reported, now that, and also mentioned by Tomo and others, uh, the UK-Japan Comprehensive Econo Economic Partnership Agreement was just approved by the parliament and the diet in both countries, and as such is about to enter into force. And I would say uh, that the UK-Japan relationship is going to be something like a critical linchpin or cornerstone of the global digital world in the years to come. And from such point of view, and with the poll results just come out, I learned a tremendous lot from all of you. And I greatly appreciate three excellent speakers, Jamie, Tomo, and Emily for offering insightful arguments. And likewise, I thank all the audience for active participation in this session. And uh, last but not least, the recording of this session will be available on the conference platform for, for two months after the event. And with that, now I'd like to draw the session to a close. Once again, I thank you very much.